Um, so Christina, uh, medical school, uh, Padua, uh, PhD in neuroscience, um, University of Lausanne. She also lectured at UNIL before joining Massachusetts General Hospital and Harvard Medical School as professor of radiology and biomedical engineering. So she's currently a senior consultant in neurology at Unispital Basel, uh, professor of neurology and biomedical engineering here at um, UNIBAS. Uh, she's also the member of the steering committee for a relatively recently formed uh, the, the Research Center for Neuroscience and, and Neuroimmunology, also here in Basel. And Christina's research program involves the pathogenesis of neuroinflammatory and cerebrovascular diseases with expertise in, in MRI and other imaging uh, modalities. So thank you for joining us. Uh, so Professor Philip Sterzer uh, also studied medicine at Ludwig Maximilians University and also at Harvard Medical School, if, if I'm correct. Um, holds doctorates in neurology, psychiatry, and psychotherapy, uh, for which he studied in Munich and Humboldt in, in Berlin. Yeah. He was formerly professor of psychiatry at uh, Charité, also in Berlin, in the focal area of computational neurosciences, which is, of course, very near and dear to my heart, very interesting. Um, also served as the head of acute psychiatry um, so you were in clinical practice there as well. Last year you joined the UNIBAS community um, as professor of translational psychiatry in faculty of medicine and you're conducting clinical practice at UPK, a psychiatric hospital. And Philip's research focuses on also functional brain imaging, uh, computation, computational modeling and psychosis and data-driven classification of, of mental disorders. I was also pleased to see that um, uh, Philip is uh, an advocate for the promotion of, of young scientists, um, who I'm also very pleased to see here in the room. So, um, you have a very interesting panel of, of experts in front of you. Um, I can open it to the floor, uh, but maybe I can kick off with a controversial question. <laughs> and you can all take a stab at it. So here in Switzerland, there's um, been a lot of resources spent on things like the, the Blue Brain Project, these large um, attempts to model a human brain, whatever you can conceive that to be. So I'm interested in, in your uh, expert opinion on the, the meaning, the utility of, of these approaches, how it's been conducted, or how it could or, or should be conducted. That was in the direction of the question I wanted to ask you, actually. So the Blue Brain Project is a, is a very ambitious project where, I mean, they really tried to model the human brain in every single aspect, reaching much more modest results. I'm a bit on the critical side, like many other people. But the question is, what did they want to do, apart the ambitious task that they had set for themselves? What do we want to What do? did they want to do, these people? So to reproduce the human brain, yes. uh, you can try to reproduce. So, so yes. They wanted to use, of course, artificial intelligence to, to model certain aspects of the brain. But I think in the end, these artificial intelligence approaches model what you call the left brain. Mm. So they don't reach so far, and hopefully they will not reach, the comprehension, so the, the Latin word of comprehender that uh, implies the activation of the right plane, like you mm. mentioned multiple times. So can you perhaps comment on these AI-related approaches and these attempts at modeling the entire brain? Um, um, yes, I, I think I can. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I remember when there was a vast grant from some world uh, stature body um, uh, for, you know, modelling the human brain. The first thing that um, a colleague of mine at UCH said, we, we can't even model a neuron yet properly. So, I mean, what, how on earth are we going to do that? And I think it's thinking in terms of building things up from a simple part. You understand something from a simple part, but actually... You only understand what a part is when you see and understand the whole that it goes to make up, as well as the other way around. So it's reciprocal. Everything is reciprocal. It's not that you just go from part up to you know, make it more complicated. You actually don't know what you're doing in the parts until you know the whole, uh, and vice versa. So th that's the first problem. And I think the, se the second problem would be that we... I think your idea about what are we trying to do is really important because 
in another talk I'll be giving in, in um, Geneva, I'm going to talk more about values. And very importantly, the left hemisphere has only one value, actually. It is extremely highly specialized in grabbing. It's the one that controls the right hand with which we, we, we grab things. And its only interest is control and power. And if you like, a lot of scientific work is simply about how can we get more control of this, how can we manipulate it? Always thinking that we'll do it for the best. Every bad thing is always introduced by we're doing it for good. You know, that, it is a universal law. Nothing bad that's ever happened in human history was introduced. This is bad. This is going to be good. So we need to have other values in our world. And they're not just that. They're things that I would say are higher in the, in the pyramid of values. Does that answer any of your questions? Well, partly, no, yeah. Just give me the bit that you did. I, the trouble no, is I don't altogether hear yeah. what you say. I so, think no, you no, said I something think rather important that I missed. I'm not sure about that. But <laughs> now, I mean, the Blue Brain Project is one, an exemplary project. Yes. Where there was a super ambitious goal, reproduce the brain. In the end, they reproduced columns of the rat cortex. Yes. yes. Um, which makes sense because the, there you can disentangle the mechanism. But in the end, I think these type of projects, they lack what you call the right hemisphere comprehension. So they lack this part, which is not reproducible, yes. which is not standardized, yes. which we don't have in the gold standards that we currently consider no. the gold standards. So no. I'm, I think that that's the current limit of our current artificial intelligence approaches which is something that we are all dealing with in the everyday life. And the real big step, which I hope will never come, is this, the, that this type of approaches or algorithm reaches the, the right hemisphere, what you call world of values, this comprehensive thinking that we have, which is not standardized, which is difficult yes. to quantify yes. and difficult to reproduce from person to person. So, I don't know what also you think I mean, about if, it, if that can be spread amongst people, that's wonderful. But the trouble with trying to do it in an artificial way is we don't know what consciousness is. And instead we produce a representation of it, a simulacrum of it, like Bing or whatever she's called, you know, chat GPT. -T. Um, and you can get as good at a simulation as anybody. You know, there are artists who are phenomenal painters, but it's not a living person. And until computers have blood running through their chips, uh, fall in love and know that they're going to die um, and enjoy sex, I mean, I don't think we're going to have um, computers that understand what it is to be a human being. And the, 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 the mistake is not that uh, human uh, machines are getting more like human, because they're not, but the, that we are becoming more like machines. This is, I think, the problem at the moment. We think mechanically, and partly it's imposed on us, because if you want to execute the simplest thing that 10 years ago involved making a five-minute phone call, you have to spend two hours on the web going around MC Escher-like loops that keep referring to themselves. Finally, you get give up and you have to sit for an hour on the end of the telephone until somebody in India answers the call and they have a script which is written by a machine and so you never break out into human experience. And that's a little vignette that we all know but actually everyday life is becoming more and more like this. People think and talk in metaphors that are derived from the machine. Sir. <laughs> Nothing else to say. No. Um, <laughs> can you hear me? Is that on? Yeah. Now it's on. Okay. Well, um, in a way, I agree with uh, most of, of uh, what has been said so far. Um, but uh, I mean, I think we should also um, think about this whole program, the Blue Brain Project, and, and you know these kinds of projects, um, maybe in a more optimistic way, um, because in a way to understand the brain, to understand what the role of our brains in us becoming persons and being persons. Um, it's, it's highly useful to build models. I think there is no other way of understanding the brain other than building models. So we have to start somewhere, and I think one question is, where do you start? Do you start at the you know, cellular level, at the column level, um, which is one approach? Um, but I wouldn't say that this is completely useless. 
uh, in a way, I mean, most of the, um, you have presented some examples of the research that your theories are based on, and these are, uh, this, is re this is mechanistic research, right? Looking at uh, stroke patients, so what deficits do they have after a certain type of stroke, using TMS to silence a part of the brain, and so on. Yes. So, and in a way, these are ways to, yeah, well, you, you assume, you have certain assumptions, you use models uh, on which you build these experiments, and I think a similar thing is true for the, for the Blue Brain project. So in principle, there's nothing wrong with it. I think, um, and to my mind, there's also nothing wrong with the, with the brain machine analogy. It's just, uh, it's just a question what we make of it, how we use it, right? So we shouldn't make the mis mistake to think that a machine can replace a person. I mean, maybe it can, it's a philosophical discussion, the whole zombie question, um, but maybe, maybe it's a waste of time, you know, asking this question. What I find much more important is to really think about when we do this mechanistic research, which has its place, which has its role, which has its importance, um, how can we build the bridge, how can we, you know, fill this explanatory gap between the mechanistic insights that we have and our personal human experience. And I think this is a major challenge that we're facing, um, but that doesn't mean that we, should, that we should stop doing mechanistic brain research. Of course, you are right, uh, up to a point. <laughs> um, there are a number of things I'd say. Um, one is the very simple one. That, and of course, I'm not opposed to science. I'm a champion of science. I want science to be truly scientific, empirical, whereas nowadays, it, too much of it is dogma. We don't look at that, we don't think about that, we only think like this. So of course, I think science is terribly important. Not all of it is mechanistic. And the trouble with um, the mechanistic model is that it does help. And from that, immediate jump is, so it's a machine, but it isn't. And if you look at a complex system, not a complicated system, but a complex system, which every organism is, and above all the brain, you can model it in such a way that in the complexity you can see, if you take a microscope and go, no, really, really, you can find a, a leads to B leads to C, even leads to D. And out of that, you can find a point in which you can intervene and change something. Result. So it's a machine. No, that's the philosophically naive problem. Because a complex system is nothing like a machine, can't be treated like a machine, doesn't behave like a machine, doesn't respond like a machine. So it's all very good for doing tiny interventions, but for understanding the brain, which is how you started, how can we understand the brain other than this? I would say we can understand it by many things. We can understand it through, through experience, of course, but through thinking in a more holistic way. So there's something that has been dubbed the McGilchrist Maneuver, <laughs> which is that what I suggest happens in the brain, and this is not just a suggestion, this is, this is reality. New experience, as you would think, because the left hemisphere is already, as it were, looking for what it knows and wants, but new experiences are best first appreciated in the right hemisphere. And you can, there's a decade of research by people like Elkin and Goldberg and Costa, which show that this is the case, that initially experience, new experience is taken by the right as a whole. It then is processed, if you like, by the left, which says, oh, I see, it's one of those. Oh, yeah, I can break it up into bits, and so on. And then that information is not wasted, it's not bad. I have nothing against it. I'm supporting that project. But it, crucially, it has to be taken back into the whole again by the right hemisphere. And the best analogy for this is learning a piece of music. If any of you have ever loved music and tried to play a piece that you hear and you think, that's great, I want to play that, the right hemisphere has a take on it. But you then start working on it and the left hemisphere goes, that passage at bar 18, I've got to keep you know, fingering it and playing it again and again. And I see here we go to the dominant, but there we return to the tonic and all this kind of thing. That's great, 
it doesn't, it's not a problem, it's not untrue, it helps you understand the music. But when you go out and perform, you must forget that completely, otherwise you'll give the most terrible performance, because it's got to have been taken up organically into the whole. Now, what I see all around me is science going, here's experience with all its richness and complexity and beauty, which we understand. Here's this resonant other with which we're engaged. We're now going to detach ourselves. We're going to take bits out of it. We're going to cut them up. We're going to find what they're made of. And at the end of it, we go, I don't think it means anything at all, but you know, if we put it together in a certain way, we're clever, we can make a machine. But this is a terrible way to think. It lacks that crucial return step. Thank you very much. I wanted to return to this, um, the, very, the hemisphere idea of the, of the brains of animals even, and you discussed these different types of attention, basically, or simultaneous attention in, in some sense. How does that intersect with our different senses? Um, because I could imagine this division of labor also being accomplished by using different senses. For example, to get this food, I'm using my, my sense of smell, for example. But to listen for predators, I've got my ears and my eyes or, or whatever. So is there some, you know, basically what's the research or what do you have to say about that kind of interaction between the different types of attention and, and the senses that we have available to us? Well, I think the simple thing I would say is that the kind of attention we pay governs what we, we are able to perceive. We, we perceive largely what we expect to perceive. The, 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 you know, neuroscientists talk about the grand illusion. A lot of what we see is not really seen, but made up on the expectation that this is probable. And if you don't think something's probable, you just won't see it. I was talking to economists in London a week ago, and in economics, it's a well-known problem that things that don't fit with the theory are simply not noticed, and then there's a huge crash, you know, like in 2008 and 9. The Queen asked <laughs> some, neuro some economists, how is it we didn't see this coming? The answer was, they didn't see it because they didn't think like that. They thought in a different way. And there's a kind of joke that economists say, um, well, it works in practice, but it doesn't really work in theory yet. <laughs> and and I, I don't think it's just economics. I think that's a problem we all have these days. The other thing I'd say is that perception is different from attention. Perception is, how, is one of the portals through which we get information about the world. But attention, I'm trying to suggest, is foundational. It's not just another... See, when I f first saw, and you won't find this controversial at all, we go anywhere in the world, ask any neurologist, they will know, if they've done their homework, that the right and left hemisphere attend in different ways. Neurologists describe this narrowing of the perception, of the tunnel of perception in people who've had right hemisphere damage. And I didn't realise how crucial that was until I brought the non-cognitively trained scientist in me into play and thought, as a philosopher, because if you ask any philosopher, they'll say, how you attend to something makes all the difference to what you find. So attention is rules all the other things. It is foundational. And um, I suggest that what comes into being comes into being between us and this other thing, as it were. It's a, a reverberative process out of which it arises, not out of just me, not out of just it, but out of this relationship. As I say, relationships are basic. In the book I've just published a year ago, which is called The Matter With Things, which is a joke, a pun in English, because we say, what's the matter? And it means, what's wrong? Um, and if you say, what's the matter with things? You mean, what's gone wrong? But I'm talking about our obsession with matter and our obsession with things. I suggest that, well, I suggest that there's a lot more to matter than, um, than the most people understand. I, I think a materialist is not someone who overvalues matter. It's someone who undervalues matter. Because after all, whatever else you believe, matter eventually eventuates in Bach St. John Passion, which is pretty incredible, if that's what you believe. I mean, I don't 
believe it's just lump and matter, but, but they were. Um, and, um, and I think the problem is in our thing thinking. But I begin with a chapter on the history of this relationship between the hemispheres, and then go on to talk about attention in time, in space, and emotionally. And then I talk about perception as a wholly separate chapter. And what's interesting is that the right hemisphere is much better on all counts of perception in every sense, um, when I say in every sense, I mean every one of the senses, um, than is the left. There are some marginal, you know, there's, there's a lot of, as always in science, there are many qualifications. Believe me, when I write, all the qualifications are there, everything is footnoted. But that's the general picture. So, yes, attention changes what we can sense. Thank you. Um, regarding the, the um, role of attention, um, I think I totally agree with, uh, with what, you, uh, what you said. I just would, uh, what, I, what I would like to comment on is the concept of attention, which is, as everybody knows, uh, everybody knows what attention is until you try to define it, right? So um, it really de depends on how you define attention. But in my mind, the um, uh, attention would be maybe a, a too narrow concept to, if I may say so, to describe what you're actually trying to get at because attention is one way that our perception is shaped by our prior knowledge, by, uh, by, by, by our expectations, but it's only one way of how, we, how, how perception is shaped. So uh, maybe I, I would even put it in a, in, in a more general way, in, uh, saying it's about our, like, our inner model of the world, our, the, our, our expectations, our predictions about the world, um, and one way we, th these expectations our, or our knowledge shape our perception is by different ways of, of using attention. But I think it's even more than just attention. Well, I think I'd just go back to your early sentence. It depends how you define attention. Right. If you define it narrowly, then it's too narrow for this purpose. I'm not defining it narrowly because I'm saying that actually the experiential world, and there is nothing beyond that that you can point to that you have knowledge of or experience of than the experiential world comes about through attention, which is actually a cre creative act. So that when you attend in a certain way to something, something else comes into being. And there's a wonderful saying by the uh, 19th, sorry, early 20th century French uh, existentialist philosopher Louis Lavelle, who says, la charité est une pure attention à l'existence de l'autrui. Love is a pure attention to the existence of the other. As a psychiatrist and as a living human being, I have seen how this attention, which I can't define, but is something to do with the whole disposition of your consciousness. It's that big, it's the whole disposition of your consciousness. It changes something for you and for the object of your attention. And in that sense, I think it is deeply creative. And the fact that we think of it as a passive, receptive process is because we have dominated by the idea of our machines, photographic plates, sensors. I think I fully agree. <laughs> I, I really fully agree with this explanation. So I had- uh, you, 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 sorry? I fully agree. Oh, <laughs> and I was wondering who, who studied medicine in the, in the audience? Did you have philosophy in gymnasium or in one year? And in medicine school, of course not. Yes, you see? Same thing, I think, in all our European countries. So it's not US here, unfortunately. So I had a last question, or is there another question from, from you, from the audience? If not, I had, can I ask another little question? <laughs> so I was wondering, um, always to you, <laughs> um, languages. Hmm. So here we are in Switzerland. We speak at least three languages. We should. So in this model left and right. So I was I was just thinking when you spoke. We say you speak. So you know a language if you dream in it. Yes, that's what they say. Which means yes. if you can activate your right hemisphere. Yes. Correct. 
You, you get what? So if you can activate, so in the end, you can really understand yes, the language yes, if yes. you can activate your right hemisphere, because this is where the dreaming experience should originate from. Yes, in theory. yes. Oh, I believe in that very much. Um, and I don't believe that learning languages is a waste of time. A lot of my education was involved in learning them. And I think it imbues in you a different perspective, a different way of thinking. I very often find that there are words in German for something that we don't have a word for in English. Um, and I, 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 particularly in German, I find. Um, and I think Goethe said something like, so viele Sprachen man spricht, so viele Leben hat man gelebt. Or, or this, mm, etwas. He's the German one, I'm uh, oh, oh, sorry, sorry, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Is that right? Something like that. Anyway, he did. Um, and I think that, it, in, in other words, sorry, I, don't, I assume you all speak everything, but um, as many languages as one speaks, yeah. so many lives has one lived. Um, and um, I, I think that's a really serious point, because I, I started out at about 20-something, thinking that the meaning of I'm hungry is different from the meaning of j'ai faim, or j'ai envie de manger. Uh, this brings a whole new idea <laughs> into being for an Englishman. And um, <laughs> by the way, the food is the one thing that's got a lot better in England in my lifetime. Uh, but anyway, um, no, I think you're absolutely right. And it embodies a kind of spirit and it changes uh, the way in which you think. So very important, yeah. Do you believe that computers can learn the language of love. You, I think you mentioned at one point that many people in front of me kind of went like this, that you cannot um, manipulate love. So what is, can you elaborate on that? Please? You probably know, I think everyone knows, there was a terrible excitement when this chat bot seem to have a conversation with a journalist saying, no, your wife doesn't really love you, I love you more, and you know, you know, and so on. And it was spooky to read, it's true. But of course, um, what the computer had done is a quick trolley dash around the internet, um, scooping everything out of Wikipedia and out of everybody's um, messaging systems and composing a probable set of words that some English person would say in this circumstance if they were prompted to try and persuade somebody that they really love them. So they can master the language of love in code form, but it's like, do you know the so-called Chinese room of, of Searle, the, this philosophical concept? Anybody know this? No. Okay, fascinating. Um, Searle had this idea of um, a machine in which there was a person um, inside who had access to a, a lexicon, and somebody stuck in a message in one language, and the person applied certain rules to it and put it out in another language, but hadn't understood the message at all. But it seemed like the message had been translated. Well, of course, Google now does this for you. But what I'm getting at is that the interiority of love is its essence. Its relationality is its essence. Love is pure relation. And I think that the traditions that talk of the founding, the ground of being, whatever you call it, li in Chinese, or ta in Sanskrit, logos in Greek, Yahweh in, in Hebrew, whatever it is, this being that is often referred to as love in all these traditions, including Buddhism, I believe this is because whatever that grounding existence is, 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 is relational. And if it is relational, it has to relate to something that is other than itself. Otherwise, that is not a free entity that can be loved. Hence, the world has gone the way it has. So, okay. may I just remark that there's a long-standing tradition in philosophy of saying life is special. And in the 19th century, they said, uh, you know, kind of the chemistry of life is different from the inorganic life. And then came Vola and synthesized urea, which was considered a, a life chemical. And then they said, yeah, but metabolism is different. And then came at the time of Pasteur making extracts and making, you know, kind of without life. I and get that, it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then at the time of Schrodinger, what is life? And that's why all the physicists went to biology to see whether inheritance was special and non-ruled by the laws of physics at the time. But, you know, 
I think it was Max Perrot who said if, or was it Peter Medavas who said uh, if something, if somebody very old and wise and experienced said something cannot be, he's almost certainly wrong. And if somebody very young and inexperienced says something can be, he or she is almost certainly right. Okay. I certainly wouldn't subscribe to that one. But, um, <laughs> but, but of course, you're entirely right. Um, you may be very surprised to learn that I don't think that there is an absolute barrier between what we call life and what we call inanimacy. But my conclusion is not that that means life is like inanimacy. My conclusion is that what we call, ignorantly, inanimate has attenuated qualities of life. And this is a point that was made by Heisenberg and, I think, Schrodinger, and is, has been elaborated greatly by a philosophical biologist called Robert Rosen in a work called What is Life? And one of the things I do in The Matter with Things is to begin by saying I suggest that many of the things that we consider are one way are exactly the opposite. So, for example, in the Newtonian universe, stasis is the norm. Motion is something abnormal that happens when we push it. We now know that motion exists everywhere and that if actual stillness could ever be achieved, which it can't, it would be the limit case of motion. And then I go through a whole lot of things like this. The determinant is just the limit case of the indeterminate. The simple is the limit case of complexity. And one of them is that devitalized is, is, is the way the left hemisphere has presented what is intrinsically vital. I argue at book length in chapter 25, which is on consciousness and matter, that consciousness cannot be a product of matter, and I'm not alone in this. It's now become pretty well accepted amongst Western, never mind Eastern, philosophers occupying university posts in philosophy. Now the general view is that consciousness is an ontological primitive, which means is it can't be made to come out of anything else. It is its own thing, and that's it. And existed as the primal substance of the cosmos. So consciousness can't be what separates inanimacy from animacy. I think what separates them is a gradational thing, which is that animacy is capable to respond more, far faster, and to a far greater range of value in this cosmos. And that's probably why life exists. Life is a very extraordinary experiment. I mean, why on earth, if you're interested in making things that last and outdo everything else, why create life? As Whitehead himself said, the secret of lasting is never to have been alive. A lump of rock it lives, lives for billions of years. Anything living, well, the actinobacteria at the, the, the depths of the ocean, single examples of which are a million years old. Darwin, eat your heart out, because we only live for 70 years. You know, we've evolved to be surviving, and you know, we don't. There's something else going on here, which is not just that kind of idea. It's that we bring a new kind of use of consciousness about, which is this response to value, and one value is love. <laughs> uh, maybe I could bring in something that's uh, more addressable, and I'll address this actually to Christine and, and, and to Philip. I'm, I'm curious, in both of your cases, if and how lateralization of the hemispheres makes an appearance in, in your research programs in the physiological and disease progression work and in the um, psychiatry and, um, and modeling. You're interested to know... Uh, so from Christina and Philip, if and how um, lateralization of the hemispheres makes an appearance in their, in their research programs? That's the question for Christina. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, so our research program um, into psychosis mm -hmm. is very much concerned with the question, um, how, does, how does psychosis emerge? How do delusions emerge? And I... Um, and one central question that we have been um, investigating is the question um, whether like, uh, a change in the experience or the perception of the world may give rise to a need for explanation that then leads to delusions. Um, because if there, is, you know, if there is a lot of need for explanation, you can't, you can't think of any rational explanation for the things you experience, then you may 
um, you know, pick irrational beliefs, bizarre beliefs even, to, to account for all the things that you experience and you can't explain otherwise. So doing this research, we, um, we never really thought about is there any particular role for the left or the right hemisphere, even though I know about the research showing also, um, you know, morphological differences. Mm. In, in, I think you also did some research on that, right, um, on the planum temporale. Um, yeah. Yeah, I've researched asymmetry. That in the inferior parietal lobule and a lot of other things. Yeah, but, but yes. um, yeah. So we were really like like a priori we were not interested in, the, in this question. But what we actually found is um, that in this in this process of um, um, well, how, how how our perception of the world may be changed, um, prediction errors, <coughs> prediction yeah. errors in perception may play a crucial yeah. role. Right, so you have a, maybe an imprecise prediction of what's going on, mm. um, maybe imprecise contextual information, or you don't use your information properly in a way, and then you experience something that we call aberrant salience. And what we actually found is very much in line with the research, that, uh, with, the, with the theory that you proposed, is that actually the right hemisphere has a, a dominant role in mediating the experience of these prediction errors. So it's actually right frontal cortex, right anterior insula, that seems to signal unexpected events, unexplained events, um, which is, I think, in line with, with what you proposed about the role of, 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 um, of, of the right hemisphere, mm. which is to actually detect unexpected things, to watch out you know, what's yeah. going on yeah. apart from your current task, apart from what, what you're yes. currently focusing on. So, in that respect, um, our research program has not, like, in a top-down manner, been inspired by yeah. the hemispheric differences. But it turns out that um, empirically, we really see a difference between yes. left and right hemisphere function, which is very much in line with your proposal, actually. Well, that's wonderful. I, I think as long as one keeps an open mind that one might find out something kind of important if you compare right and left. But very often, research is not reported in such a way that you can distinguish between life and left, because the question is never asked, because the writers already know that there's nothing there to look at. But you're already finding that if you don't even ask the question, it comes and presents itself to you. As Ramachandran says, the right hemisphere is the devil's advocate, the one that says, well, it might not be like this. You know, people often think, oh, the right hemisphere is the one that jumps to conclusions, but it isn't. It's the left hemisphere that's quick and dirty. Kahneman's type one thinking is the left hemisphere at work. It has to make a quick judgment on very little. And it's the right hemisphere that comes along and goes, hang on. So, yeah. So I'm delighted what you're really saying is that you're being moved more and more to contemplate thinking about the hemisphere differences as well. My turn. Or Maybe we should, yeah. <laughs> no, so I mean, different than uh, for him, we don't do any specific research on lateralization in our group, but I believe that we use the right hemisphere widely. We so use we, we use a lot the, what we call the right hemisphere in our current research and clinical practice, in research, I think we are forced to proceed in a very logical way, following the, the scientific method, but in the end, often, we do get results that do not confirm our initial hypothesis. So you need to have to develop a global thinking that gets you out of this box of logical consequences to be able to interpret. So I believe that there we are using almost every day of our right brain. And the second part is, as a clinician, of course, you need to use your right brain. So if you're in front of a patient, um, to understand the patient, and again, getting back to the latent word, there is no other way. I mean, you can explain logically whatever you know, whatever you have learned, but if you don't understand the patient, you will never be able to convey certain message about diagnosis, therapy, and so on not even to get the right questions for research. So I believe that these are very common practices, yeah. Yes, well, as long as one remembers to ask the question. Um, the question was if you use the right brain in our, uh, or the lateralization yes. of the two parts, yeah. Yes, 
And uh, just in case anybody thinks that there's, um, you know, I'm, I'm some sort of slightly sad um, loner here, um, I, I've got people like Ramachandran on record saying this is absolutely fascinating. Don't know why it wasn't better researched before. Um, a, a person called Tim Crow, who's a neuroscientist and also a psychiatrist, who's very well known to anyone who's researched schizophrenia has said, and if I had my slides, I'd show you the exact quote, but basically what he says is nothing in psychology or psychiatry makes any sense unless one takes into account laterality. And you probably know, um, well, if you're in the world of, um, of, of that kind of research, you'd know that um, the Gotthard, Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz Prize, which I believe is Germany's top prize for science, was awarded to Ono Günterkun at Bochum um, for his work on lateralization. And I had a quote from him, which again, I can't show you, but he says, no function in the brain is unaffected by laterality. And unless one understands lateralization, one doesn't understand the function of the brain. So the light is dawning, guys. I mean, I'm just John the Baptist, but it's going to happen. <laughs> Um, I was just wondering, um, maybe it's just a semantic point, but um, how much of what is being described as division or laterality or um, yeah, lateralization of function could be explained just by sort of differences in the thresholds that you use to view things in response in particular to Philip's yes. response just now? Thank you, that's a very good point. I mean, what I definitely want to get away from is, is the idea of an all or nothing, anything. <laughs> I mean, the all or nothing view is the typical left hemisphere view. What do you mean? There's some here and some there, can't be. But no, there is. Um, the right hemisphere appreciates we need both. And so the end of it is, my view is the right hemisphere is just better at these things. Not that the left hemisphere can't do any of this. But in every case, that anything that's important for understanding, I can show you that in Gorsen und Ganzen, the right hemisphere is going to be better at this than the left hemisphere. And it's just so, so much of this, and it's so overwhelming that one can't deny it. But of course, thresholds come into it, and there's a sort of sfumato that one has to have in the depiction of these things. It's not a entirely delineated. I'm talking in terms of tendencies but the tendencies overall can be so marked that they can change the world. I have a question regarding the, um, maybe I should read your latest book, but um, I haven't so far. So um, my question relates to the, um, the actual relationship between um, <clears throat> the left and right brain hypothesis that you put forward on the one hand side, and what you said about um, the role of science Uh, in our culture. Okay. Um, so what is, what is the connection? Because, I mean, I think many people mm. have, have said that, you know, that mm. we are in, uh, like Western, Western culture has developed into this yeah. very scientific um, uh, direction without referring to left and right hemisphere. So mm. what is the role in the left-right hemisphere hypothesis or theory in actually um, making these conclusions about our culture? That's the first part of the question. And the second part of the question is, I, I, you did not um, explicitly say that, but I took it from what you said that you kind of encourage us to use our right brain more than you know, just the left brain, which we, which we have a tendency to do um, in our culture. So how can we possibly do that? I mean, how can I tell my brain to be more active on the right side rather than the left side? Do I have any... Yes, Influence on that? Absolutely, thank you very much. Well, the first thing was about, um, since we've managed well so far, um, you see, a lot of people would think we haven't managed that well. There's been a history, which is the second part of the, the early book, The Master and His Emissary, or early er book, nine, um, 2009. Um, 
in which, as I say, I review the history of the West and show that civilizations have a tendency for the right and left hemisphere insights to be extremely vibrant and um, to work together at the beginning of a civilization. You can see this in 6th century BC in Athens. You can see it around what we call the year dot, you know, zero AD, um, in the Roman case. And you can see it in the Renaissance, I believe, in, in our own civilization. And in each case, and if, I mean, I can't explain to you why I say this, but if you read, you'll see, uh, I can show through the art, through the philosophy, through the literature, that gradually, 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 they moved more and more to a left hemispheric um, administrative, um, abstracted way of thinking, and the civilization collapsed. Now, I mean, I, I'm far from saying I can explain why a civilization collapses. I mean, I think there are 370 explanations that have been put forward for the, d the demise of the Roman Empire. But what I'm really saying is that whatever its causes, I can see this pattern accompanying it, which is whatever it's caused by, you see this deterioration. And I think a lot of people would accept that our civilization has not got the balance right. I mean, you'd really be an unusual person for me to meet anywhere in life, from any walk of life, who doesn't think there's something badly wrong right now, and it's due to our exploitative, utilitarian, power-hungry, controlling way of thinking. We've driven out all the subtler ways of relating to the world that used to be instinctual in us. For me... I haven't answered your second question yeah, yet. But but just, just to follow up on this. Yeah. So, but do we need knowledge about the function of the left and the right brain to reach such an analysis of you know, how our culture has evolved? Do we need this knowledge about the brain? I, I was just coming on to that. Okay. <laughs> Because your second question was what we can do about it. And I'm a psychiatrist. And I know that it is no good saying to anybody which I often can after meeting them the first time, you should do this and that and the other. They won't do it, because if it was that simple, they'd have thought of it already and done it. But what actually every practitioner will tell you is you need to allow that person to see for themselves what it is they're doing wrong. So what you do is you open their eyes to what it is they're getting wrong, and then they go, aha. Uh -huh. Now, when I was young and inexperienced, I used to tell people on their first meeting, I'd talk to them for an hour and a quarter, I used to say, I think the problem is this and you need to do that. They never listened. Well, I said, okay, I was sending you for therapy, and I'd review them, and when they came back after six or nine months, they'd say, you know, I've discovered what the problem is. And it was exactly the thing I said to them six or nine months earlier. So the point I'm really making is that the first step on recovery is to know what the problem is. Because if you can address, you see, look at it this way. In a very piecemeal way, we can, with luck, help to halt the destruction of the forests of the world. With luck, we can hope to clean the toxicity out of the oceans. I don't know that this is possible at all, but with luck we could. But none of this would matter if our only reason for doing it was to save our skins. We wanted to preserve the rainforest because it was better for the economy and it made things easier for us. The only good reason is we learned that the rainforests are the most exquisite expression of the multiplicity, the sort of simple purposelessness, purposeless purpose, I'm sorry, I'm trying to quote Kant there, um, of nature, that it has this beauty and richness in itself for itself, not for utility. We always mistake that it's something to do with utility. If we think like that, then I hope we all die and some other better, wiser people come along. If we need the world to be saved, it's actually us we're thinking about saving because the world will survive, nature will survive, will come back in another form. It's done it many times before. But it won't do any good to save our skins if we carry on thinking like the selfish, dissatisfied, disgruntled, greedy people we are. We need to reconnect with something beyond the material. That's knowledge that has been there since time immemorial across the world. And why do we think we're so clever that we can disregard it? We're technically clever. We've got left hemisphere cleverness till it comes out of our ears. But we've got no right hemisphere understanding. Now, what can we do about it? Well, the first thing is we can begin to see what we're doing. And when you see what you're doing, you will see it in daily life. 
if you've listened to what I say, I bet you'll have the experience that so many people say to me, after I've read you, I can never look at the world the same way again. I see it everywhere. Now, if that's the case, you can push back everywhere in your daily life against pointless bureaucracy, against the virtualization of life, against all this anti, anti-life, anti-embodied way of thinking. And one simple, very practical thing, because everybody wants something they can do in 10 minutes that will save the world. Well, you could practice mindfulness. I think mindfulness is wonderful. It's so simple that even I can do it. I mean, I don't really know much about meditation, but I can make myself change my attention, still my talkative left hemisphere, which is what they call monkey mind, chat, chat, chat. Oh, I know, I've got it, you know. No, shut up. And let whatever it is come into being, because it only does that if you create a space for it. You know, a gardener can't make a plant, but a gardener can sure stifle a plant and kill it. We can't make what is real come into being, but we can kill it with our cleverness and our thoughts. So absent them. And I promise you, that you will, every one of you who does it will find something new, real and beautiful coming into being. It's worth trying. It only takes 10 minutes. Or longer if you like it. If you like it, you can do it all day. So... I had a common respect. You, you made this nice metaphor of the, um, the man with a hammer only sees nails, um, re- perhaps referring to molecular biology and how it predated all life sciences. Is, is the theory of lateral hemisphere just another hammer? <laughs> yes, it's a, it's a good question. Um, it could be, except that I never um, myself want to limit anything to a certainty It's not a philosophy that says this is how it is. It's more one that says this is how it isn't. And that is, negation is the way in which one opens up to possibility and to creation. The first thing we've got to do is to see there's something wrong. And I think the hemisphere hypothesis, which by the way, I call a hypothesis still, but a lot of people are saying you shouldn't call it a hypothesis. The science behind it is, So, well, really, I mean, read, find out. It's it's so obvious, it's terribly important. Um, And, and, you know, uh, what I'm really saying is, I I get your point, if one reduced everything to it, then that would be like reducing everything to a nail. But I'm not reducing anything to it. If you may remember, I, I, I said, I'm not here to explain what causes what. I'm just saying you can see these patterns. You know, in Shakespeare, there's a line in Hamlet, look on this picture and look on this. And what I'm really saying is, look on this picture I'm presenting to you, and now look at life. Over to you, mate. I'm not telling you anything. Yeah, at the end, the currency of science is predictability. If your theory or your hypothesis can bring any predictability, it will, we will take it. I mean, I work here in this... Uh, box of reduction, reductionism. So, and the second comment I had is, you talk about um, the balance between right and left uh, brain and how somehow modern society is pushing us towards a use of only one of the parts because of how machine-like the world is. Uh, is there a moral judgment that is somehow Uh, so somehow would you feel attached to the world how it was and why is less human the use of one hemisphere respect the balance between the two you know can somebody please I I, I just I'm I'm sorry I'm very deaf can somebody just say in clear words what was asked there I can can try you can tell Mm. me later or not The question, Ian, is if there's um, uh, a, a moral, a moral. I- implication, if, if there's a, a favoritism, or do you have a preference in a sort of Confucius way of a time in the past when things were better that we've sort of since degraded from? Okay. Does yeah, that get yeah, the spirit yeah, of it? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. No, okay. So the thing is that somehow the world, humans are always in an environment that is changing, and now the environment that we have is this somehow machine world. Yes. And that doesn't make us less humans, because we are interacting with it, no? Well, I think we can make ourselves more human or less human. 
And I think that um, what's happening is of moral meaning. Um, and that's not, I mean, if you don't believe in morality, then I'm sorry I can't talk to you. But morality seems to me a rather important aspect of life. Um, and what I'm really saying is that this way of thinking, this greedy, acquisitive, destructive way of thinking is morally reprehensible. You know, take it or leave it. As about the past, as I say, we can become more human or less human. What we have been sold is a completely bonkers idea, which is that everything that comes along is going to be better than what was before. When there is change, rationally speaking, there is a 50% chance it will be better and a 50% chance it will be worse. To be so blind and stupid that you just say, oh, it's all better because it's new, it's to be as stupid as saying, oh, I only want to hang on to what we had. We have to evaluate it. I hope I've been evaluating things this evening. I can do it better in print, so if you want to read me, but if not, there we are. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. I'm interested in sleep. Um, Dreams. And sleep. Uh, maybe you could discuss just the role of, of sleep in the evolution of the brain, especially the early, early brain. Um, you know, um, you know, what happens when we sleep? Uh, what are these two hemispheres doing when, you know, when we sleep? Was it what's happening in dreaming? When we're sleeping, um, what's the function of the, what are the different functions of the hemispheres oh, okay. whilst yes, we're sleeping? Yes. Well, here I disagree with um, a colleague who is extremely knowledgeable and from whom I've learned a lot, who thinks that in dreaming the left hemisphere is somehow freed from the regulation of the right hemisphere, which is why none of it seems to make sense. I don't believe that, and in fact the evidence from um, you know, blood flow scans and from EEGs and so forth is that during sleep there is certainly more right hemisphere activity than during waking, and that probably there is more right hemisphere activity overall. Both of them work. I mean, some animals, like dolphins, as you probably know, wake with one hemisphere and sleep with the other so that they never have to... Um, you know, they, they, can, they can manage on, 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 on without, without full loss of consciousness. Um, but humans, in humans, I think the right hemisphere is more, um, more, more active. And indeed, it's the right hemisphere that is able to draw together many strands of meaning and metaphorize them, make a metaphor of them. And that's what I think is happening when we're dreaming. And I argue in the earlier book, in The Master and His Emissary, and much more in the later book, that actually all meaning is of this metaphoric kind. All language is ultimately metaphoric. And the most e extraordinarily vivid examples are in science and philosophy, where all the words are actually metaphorical. Um, we abstract, literally comes from Latin meaning abs and trahere, to drag away. Um, you know, the word metaphor itself means a bridge that carries a cross. Every word we use is metaphorical in its meaning. And what happens in the waking analytic mind is everything is reduced to a single line, which is sequential in time. And it's been pointed out by, I can't remember his name now, but he's a jurist, a, 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 an expert on the theory of law who is the head of one of the Max Planck Institutes in Germany, who has made the point that organizations should maximize people's use of intuition because it can take into account and weigh 16 different things, whereas the analytic mind is always strapped to this explicit line, which is why you know, a poem has so many ways of meaning. There are often ambiguous terms, metaphors, assonances, and so on. When you translate it into a piece of prose, it's utterly dead. It's lost all its meaning. But dreams are metaphors. I guess if there's pressing issues, we could maybe address it more informally. But I'd like to thank everybody for coming, especially those who stayed all through this discourse. Thank you so much to Christine and to Philip. And of course, thank you very much to Ian. Um, and yeah, I look forward to seeing you again and continuing these, these discussions. So have a lovely weekend. Everybody. I'd just like to thank you both, too. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.